Welcome. I'm George Benson, Dean of the Terry College. I'm pleased to see so many of you here this morning, so bright and early. This, uh, for those of you who have not been here before, welcome to our new Executive Education Center. I know there are a number of new people here today. We had our grand opening here last May, so it hasn't been a full year yet that we've been operating at full strength in here. We do a number of programs here, and by the way, we're on uh, three different floors in this building. Our Executive MBA program is based here. We have a Chief Financial Officer Roundtable, quarterly roundtable that we do here. We have a Director's College that we do here for uh, members of prospective members of boards or current members of boards of directors. And by the way, the last time we did that program, we had 50 people come from all over the United States, and we're very pleased with how that is uh, how that's going. We've got a new program I'll tell you about in, in a couple of minutes that we're also going to be starting here as well. But I want to begin uh, this morning, as always, by recognizing the sponsors, the people that make this uh, event possible and, and enable us to charge uh, only $30 rather than $80 or $90 for this. But uh, if I could, uh, Public Broadcasting Atlanta is one of our two media sponsors and been with us since the beginning. We have at least one person here, and I, I see she's got a microphone in her hand as usual, Harriet Hoskins Abrahal. Harriet, we're pleased that you're with us. Is Irene with you today? Yeah. Irene Wren, and Irene Wren is also here. Thank you both for being here. She's I think you have an announcement. CFO. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. A couple of news items from WABE. Um, first of all, uh, some of you may know that we've started podcasting our flagship local program, a book review program called Between the Lines. I was reading just this week that 5 million people use podcasting right now, but 2010 we'll have 63 million people, which means a lot for us in radio, of course. Uh, streaming, we've always well, we've streamed our regular WABE programs for several years. This past month, rather quietly because it's still in the experimental stages, we are streaming two other uh, lines. One is a 24-hour news program, including a lot of BBC material, as well as some of you may know shows like Talk of the Nation. And another stream is 24 hours a day classical music programming. So that's quite an addition for us. Lastly, um, look out and listen up for an interesting event in Atlanta. Uh, a caravan is coming called StoryCorps, in which people inter are interviewed by each other, ordinary everyday folk, um, for national broadcast. It's sort of a touch of Americana, a 10-year national public radio project. Pretty exciting. And if you have any good stories or you know of anybody with a, with a good story, uh, please contact us. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. And from the Atlanta Business Chronicle, our other media sponsor is Bill Chandler here. Bill, over here. Bill, glad you're here. Sharon Eakes with you. Yes. Sharon, Sharon is over here. Thank you both for being here. Uh, finally, RBC Centura is our exclusive corporate sponsor. I'm not sure if anybody's here from RBC today. Anybody here? Yes. Yep. Who, and who are you? Never yet, thank you. What, what's your name? Hunter Court. Hunter Court. Glad you're here, Hunter. Good to see you again. Uh, upcoming Terry Third Thursdays, I want to tell you about, I think, three very special programs uh, immediately ahead of us. The first one, March 16th, we will have Walter Driver will be our speaker. And Walter was insta installed earlier this month as the 59th president of the United States Golf Association, a very uh, significant honor, a very uh, prestigious position, a uh, very uh, a position with a, a lot of responsibility associated with it. The last time we had a Georgian as president of the USGA was 1949, so it's been quite a while. Uh, Walter retired at the end of 2005 as chairman of King & Spalding. He spent 35 years with the company. The last 15 of those years, uh, he was the chairman. Uh, this, I believe, will be a very interesting program. I would urge you to register for this one early. Uh, then in April, David Stockert, who is president and CEO of Post Properties, also should be an interesting event. We could look forward to that one. I know I will. And then in May, a, a really special event, Horace Newcomb. Horace Newcomb, is, you may not know the name, but uh, you will after you come to this event. Uh, Horace Newcomb is the director of the Peabody Awards at the University of Georgia. Uh, Peabody Awards are often referred to as the most prestigious award uh, in electronic media. Uh, I'll give you an example of uh, how that works. Katie Couric uh, won an award, and she's won many awards. And uh, Katie said, when I won other awards, my publicist or my agent would call me up to tell me about it. When I won the Peabody Award, the president of NBC called me up to tell me about it. That's the Peabody Award. We're very proud of it at the University of Georgia. It's administered by the Grady College of uh, Journalism, uh, and uh, we also have the archive uh, for the Peabody Award at the University of Georgia. Horace will be here with us right before the big event in, I think it's June 5th this year, 
at the Waldorf Astoria in the Grand Ballroom where the awards are given out. So he will be here to preview the award winners for us. I expect it to be a multimedia event. It should be a lot of fun, and I hope I'll see you all here. Uh, one other calendar note. We have our annual alumni awards recognition event. Uh, will be a dinner this year. It's been a lunch at Maggiano's the last two or three years. This time we're going to do it right here in the Executive Education Center. It will be on Wednesday, May 17th. And the alumni award winners this year are Leo Wells, up here in Atlanta, Joe Beverly from Thomasville, Paul Holmes from Monticello, and our outstanding young alumnus, Richard Korch. And Richard is with us this morning. Where are you, Richard? I say, Richard, over here. <laughs> Congratulations, Richard. So I hope some of you will make that event. It should be a very special evening. Uh, now, also, the program I was talking about that's new, something we're going to open here for the first time at the center, beginning in May, we're going to hold a, an executive program, which is essentially a certificate program for financial planners. Uh, upon completion of this 13-month program, the uh, students will be eligible to sit for the Certified Financial Planning Planners Board exam, the CFP exam. Uh, if you're interested at all in this program, you can see me or you can see the director of our program who is with us this morning, Tom Couch. Tom, where are you? Tom, would you stand, please? So this is, uh, you know, I mentioned a few of the things we do. There are many, many other things we do. We bring students down here for networking with the business community. We bring students down here to interview. There are some companies who would prefer not to make the trek out to Athens, and so we bring the students down here. Uh, we, have, we hold all sorts of meetings and other events. Uh, we have a, a marketing research conference, that we, a national conference that we hold here each year. We've just uh, held two events uh, for the uh, governor uh, in this facility recently. Uh, and so it's also available. If you'd like to use the facility, please see any of us uh, involved with it, and we'd be happy to talk with you about it. Okay, let's get to the main event now. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker, Tom Crawford. Uh, Tom is president and CEO of Crawford & Company, which is headquartered right here in Atlanta. But he's not the Crawford uh, in the name of the company. It's, it's somewhat confusing. Uh, the current family patriarch is uh, Jess Crawford. Jess is still the uh, chairman of the board of the company. Uh, but what Tom doesn't have in the bloodlines associated with the company, he has in the experience in the insurance industry. He's been in the industry for 40 years now. Uh, Crawford & Company, of course, is the largest provider of insurance claims management services in the world. Uh, Tom joined Crawford & Company in September 2004, and that was shortly right after a Hurricane Charlie hit, right before we get into this whole massive set of hurricanes we had to deal with down here in the southeast. Quite a hectic time for the company. Uh, I actually got to know Tom back in the mid-1990s. Uh, Tom was with Prudential at that time in New Jersey, and I was the dean of the Rutgers Business School, uh, also in New Jersey. And he was chairman and CEO of Prudential Property and Casualty Company, PRUPAC. Uh, Tom was a graduation speaker for us at Rutgers. Uh, Tom also served on the Board of Overseers for the Rutgers uh, Business School. And little did I know at the time, as I was getting to know Tom, that he had deep Georgia roots. And little did I know at the time that I would be moving to Georgia within a year or two after meeting Tom up there. Uh, here in Atlanta, Tom served, actually founded and served as the CEO of Southern Heritage Insurance Company, which was eventually uh, sold to uh, Geico in 1991. Tom has been back in Georgia. Tom, where are you? Tom, here he is. <laughs> the only person in the room I can't see. Direct. Tom's been back, I think since 2002 or 2003. Is that about right? Uh, Something like that. Two. 2002. So Tom's been back here. We're thrilled to have him back here. I've gotten him involved. Uh, with the Terry College of Business. He's spoken for us. He's on my Board of Overseers uh, for the Terry College, and I'm very pleased that he's here with us today, and we'll be talking about building a successful environment for business. Tom Crawford. That's my talk, just in case you're wondering. I, uh, I'm always kind of honored and, and uh, humbled when I talk to a group of successful business people. Uh, it's uh, a real pleasure for me, and I'm glad you asked. I am so proud of the Terry School of Business, and I made this note just now as you talked about the CFP program. <clears throat> I am recovering from that bug that I think people have had, and uh, so my voice is a little gravelly. Uh, the CFP program, I have said over and over again, I think it's one of the Number one jobs in the country today is financial planning. It's a lot different than telling someone you're a life insurance agent. I had to go through the recruiting process of Prudential of getting people on board. It was a lot easier to recruit uh, 
and I think actually the senior class of 01 around the United States voted that the number one job in the country, financial planning. I don't know if you realize that, but uh, had an opportunity to talk at several universities about why don't we build programs for uh, CFPs, Certified Financial Planning. So that's a good thing. I walked into uh, a bookstore last night, and the first thing that hit me in the face was a book. And I wrote it down on a card because I knew I couldn't remember it, and that was uh, Dr. Henry Cloud. He wrote the book, and it's called, the big words on the front of the cover was Integrity, The Courage to Meet the Demands of Reality. I don't know if you've seen that book or not. I, I haven't read it, but it certainly hit home to me as I was uh, going through some business issues the last couple of days of a major company calling our company up asking for information that was uh, illegal with threats behind the request. And my officers came to me and said our answer to that request was no, uh, with the threat of a substantial piece of business leaving our company. And then I walk into that store last night and I see this book, Integrity, The Courage to Meet the, the, need, the Needs of Reality that We're Faced With Every Day. And that's part of the business environments that you have to build. And if it means losing a piece of business, then it, so be it. And I was extremely proud of our staff, and I believe that we've been in the process of building a business environment at Crawford & Company that, that certainly will place our company as the most respected company in the world. That's what our goal is, and that's what our challenge is. I started off the morning by getting up <clears throat> and leaving my glasses at home. So this is, uh, hopefully I got these notes in, in big print, but I don't have to use them very much because I'm talking about something that I really enjoy talking about. And I'm talking to people who some of you have already experienced uh, building successful business environments. But you know what? There's a lot of companies and a lot of places that we don't have good business environments. I wake up lately, and I guess over the last three or four years, the thoughts that's been going through my mind is a few fears that I have. And this is after 40 years of walking into a lot of companies and seeing the environments we have. And the fears I have today are three. One of them I won't talk a lot about, but one of them is the pressure on CEOs, pressure on senior management to respond to analysts over focusing on the long-term health of companies. And I think we see the results of that in our climate today around the business world, of some things that's happened that shouldn't have happened. And I think some of it was driven by this one cent, two cent, you missed the projections or you're over by one or two cent. Who cares? I mean, I say that because now I'm 60-some years old and I can say it. I might not have said it when I was 55 or 60 and have to deal with them further into my career, but I think it's something we should be fearful about in our environments and running businesses today is that pressure that's been established by analysts. The second thing that I get a little concerned about when I even read a book about it is the client comes first. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands about how many people think the client comes first. I don't. And that may startle you, but it feeds right into what I'm going to talk about, building business environments where employees are excited and happy about working for your company because it leads into me saying that I think the employees and the associates come first. I don't know how you ever deliver what you want to deliver to a client when you're, the employees that are touching those clients every day are not working for a company and they're not happy. They don't like going to work for you. So I don't agree with the client comes first. And the other one that uh, concerns me, and it's a fear of mine, is connectivity. The lack of connectivity between the people who are running a company and the people that are getting the jobs done every day in the field and in corporate headquarters. Where is that connectivity, and have we lost it, and can we build upon it to bring people back uh, and connect themselves to the objectives and the goals of the corporation? And at the same time, and this is extremely important, build an environment where they can realize their personal goals and objectives. Now, I'm going to take you back in time just a little bit because I'm talking about the subject that I like to talk about best, but I think sometimes, well, why do you think this way, Tom? Uh, and I take you back to my early career. My early career, I can recall, uh, and maybe some of you are aware of this, building uh, high-voltage power lines across country, the hills of Virginia and West Virginia. I was in a construction crew, working my way through college. I was working summers, but I went to work for that company full-time. I did such things as, well, you know, there's three kind of jobs in a construction operation. They're skilled, semi-skilled, and then unskilled. I was unskilled. I was what was called a grunt. You know what a grunt is? 
that's the, guy, the person that passes tools up to the people doing the real job. So you're call, I was called a grunt. I found out a little bit more about that lately when, as I do projects around the house, and I keep asking my, my spouse to go get me this, get me the hammer, get me the screwdriver, and she grunts and gives me these uh, feelings of I'm not real happy with being your grunt. So uh, I didn't understand the full meaning of it then, but I do now uh, when I address it with my wife. The uh, What happened to me? Driving a bulldozer, if you can imagine that, or driving an 18-wheeler. I know you can't imagine me doing that. Was that I got to, to grow a respect for people for all walks of life. I was working beside people out of the hills of West Virginia. I was working with people who had 7th grade, 8th grade educations. I was working with people with college degrees. And what I found out by working with them for years is that they were the same as I was inside, regardless of my education or my thoughts. I love my family. They love their family. They, ha they have work ethics. They have ethics. And so I gained what I think was, has stayed with me forever, and that is a full respect for all walks of life and giving those people an opportunity to succeed. I don't know of anybody that gets up in the morning, whether it's a construction crew or an executive at a company, says, I'm going in and do a bad job today. It's not what it's about. So why can't we build environments where people can get up in the morning with the thought of doing a good job? And then I remember clearly being a clerk. And you say, how does this tie in? It ties in greatly. I was a clerk at Allstate. It was the first white-collar job I had. And I'm thinking as a clerk uh, at Allstate Insurance Company in Roanoke, Virginia, why didn't the leadership of Allstate come by my desk? Why didn't they talk to me? And I'm a clerk. These are the thoughts I had. Why did they go into a corner office and have meetings and, and then leave the building? With me driving home at night, even as a clerk, an underwriter, an adjuster, thinking, what are they talking about? What are they doing that's going to impact my job? What are they going to do about my division? Are they going to move the office out of run -up? The same things I'll bet you that you've driven home and thought about sometimes as you were growing up in your career, why don't they talk to us? Why don't they tell us what's going on? And I'm saying that because there are no business secrets other than what the SEC says I can't say about a public company. There aren't any business secrets. So why don't we share with our employees what's going on in our company and what are the meetings in the corner offices all about? So I thought that, and then I said, if I ever get to that supervisory management role, that I would always talk to all the employees and allow all the employees to ask me questions, which the best part of this whole thing uh, is that you get to ask me questions. I think that's the best part of anybody talking to you about building something or a business issue. And then becoming a supervisor. What it meant to me to take over an underwriting division at Allstate, walking and sitting down and having the people, the very people who train me to be an underwriter, all of a sudden I'm their boss. Well, you talk about a humbling experience, and how do you get their, their working relationship with you as you all of a sudden become their boss? And do we teach that? How, do we teach someone to come in out of a college, sit down as a supervisor, and take over a group of people who have been doing a job for 10 or 15 years, and you're the boss? How do you handle that situation? So as we talk about training and development, those are things that I think we have to teach to people coming into businesses. Now, I happen to be with a company in my early part of my career that was the best. I, to this day, have more respect for Allstate Insurance Company than any company I have ever worked for because in my desk from the day I started was a quarterly training plan called Tom Crawford's Personal Training Plan. It was amazing. Every employee in the company had one. And it might only be two subjects for the quarter, but they gave you a course or they put you in a class, but they were training and developing from day one. And it meant a lot to me, and it's something that I do today. And when I summarize and tell you about how I build successful business environments, you'll know how I've pulled all the experiences I've had from being a clerk to a supervisor. And then the last one that I thought had a huge impact on my career was being in the military. I was a drill sergeant, and so now I've been an 18-wheeler uh, bulldozer operator, and here I am a drill sergeant. You can't picture that, can you, the smoky bear, bear hat? And uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, I was training young men to, to go to Vietnam, and uh, it was quite an experience for me, but again, the respect you gain for people and jobs like that. But what that job did for me more than anything else, it allowed me to stand at a podium 
and have the confidence to talk to people and train people. I did it on podiums where there's a thousand soldiers out in front of me. I've done it in a classroom where there's hundreds of soldiers in front of me. And it's a very serious job when you know they're going off and they may not come back. So it taught me how to train and uh, hopefully develop people. Then the second part of my career and the impact it had from the early part, I went to work for CNA. I, went, I was a vice president of underwriting for CNA. I had the toughest decision of my life to do something, and that was to leave a company who for 12 years dedicated five of those years to just developing me in an environment where they actually gave me years of experience in various jobs, not because I was, uh, you know, wanted to work in claims or I wanted to work in underwriting or I wanted to work in sales, because they wanted me to be a general manager. And it wasn't a one-week or two-week assignment. They developed me to be a general manager. And all of a sudden, I was faced with taking a 10-year leap in my career because of what Allstate did for me. So then it comes down, when you build a great environment for business, there's two things you have to consider. And I want those two things in every company that I build or take over or turn around, and I have. And it's called this. Here's money. Uh, Mr. Giblin's in the room. John, here's, and he's my CFO and a good one. Uh, here's 10,000 more. Here's 20,000 more to go to work for company ABC. And I want John to have to struggle with that decision, $20,000. That's you know, a lot of money. But what about the environment you're in? And how many companies can put an environment in front of you that makes you think twice and three times before you take a leap into your career and make a change? Because I can tell you right now, and I've touched a lot of companies, the environments aren't always good. They aren't really concerned about the employee. They've lost the connectivity that I've been talking about. And so the decision is very easy. Here's 20000 I'm gone. Do it at a mid-level job. Here's 5000 They're gone. Look at the turnover ratios in companies. But what happens when you build an environment where you really enjoy doing and you really know that company knows what you do and what you contribute? You think twice about leaving. So it's not just about profit and growth and success of a, a business environment. It's about turnover ratio and the, very, the fundamentals that you have to address to be uh, successful in a, in a career. So I took a 10-year leap, and I finally made the decision to do it. But it was a 10-year leap, and I made the right decision, but it was really tough to leave Allstate. But that background gave me the ability to come here in Atlanta and build a company in 1984 a general manager, knowing how all the components have to fit together. And I said to myself when I built that company, it would be different than any other company. Of course, that's what you're supposed to think about when you're going to build a company. It's going to be different and better. But my philosophy in building that company, that no one would touch Southern Heritage Insurance Company that was not the best. Do you have the power as you build your environment to hire people better than you or have the potential to be better than you? Are you afraid of doing that? Because if you are, you're not going to get the environment that will move a company rapidly forward. And I, I believe in Southern Heritage was a great example of that. You know, I interviewed hundreds of people for seven jobs. We started with seven people, not an insurance agency now, an insurance company, just like an Allstate. I interviewed hundreds of people, hired seven people. Do you know how much turnover I had in the first seven years of that company? Zero. None. Because the environment that I always dreamed of rebuilding was there. We paid people 5% better than average because I wasn't building an average company. And we did it from day one, and we maintained that. We built an environment where they couldn't meet with, they had to meet with me once a month, whether they liked it or not, and they had to have a question on a piece of paper because people are shy. They won't ask a question. But to get into the room, they had to write it down on a piece of paper and give it to me. And what they were asking about was amazing how easy we could fix things within the company by just knowing that they were concerned about it, listening to people. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to take over another company. I, it was kind of build and then turn around to Prudential. Prudential never made any money in its history in prop and casual, ever. In fact, they lost their entire company in Andrew in 1991. Uh, their entire capital was gone. And basically, I had another opportunity to put an environment together where people could identify with the goals and challenges of the company. I remember clearly putting one goal in front of those people in a cafeteria, all of them present, is that we had never made money from an underwriting standpoint. I won't bore you with details about loss ratios, but a combined ratio means if you have 105 combined, you're paying out $105 for every 100 you take in. That's not good. And so we set a goal in 1996 of 98 and 98. We were at 115, by the way. 
98 and 98. You know, make uh, $2 out of every 100. And that was a badge. It was buttons. It was cards. It was some signs everywhere. And that team pulled together with a lot of other ingredients and made that company a 97.6 in 1998 and the most profitable thing in Prudential. And it was all because of the people and the staff, the people we surrounded ourselves with, and building an environment where they could realize their own personal goals. In building an environment of success for a company, do you think if you take over a turnaround situation or you're building something, that your value on the street as an individual is higher with a company that's starting to soar or a company that is in the trenches forever, like Prupac was, for example? That management team was never solicited by anybody. But what do you think happened three years later to that management team from a solicitation standpoint when it was making headlines of being successful? The personal value of the people that work for you soars. And guess what they're faced with sometimes? Here comes the offer. Before, they would have jumped in a heartbeat. But here comes the offer of that five and 10000 more. And now they have to weigh two things, not one thing. They weigh the money. They weigh the environment. So there is so many things you get from building a successful business environment. And then there's Crawford & Company, which I love the name. I have a lot of clothes now that has the world on top of the name Crawford. Uh, my son likes it, and, uh, and I'm blessed. But in between, and i got a few minutes here, in between was an interesting thing that happened to Tom Crawford. I retired after we took Prudential Public in, 19, in 2001. And I thought, boy, how many of you think about retirement? How many? A lot? Great, right? It's going to be the best thing since sliced bread. That's exactly what I thought. Wow, I'll get to fish and hunt and do things I like to do, boat. And I did. And my wife and I bought a boat. We did 6,000 miles on a boat for 10 months. And I thought it was the greatest adventure of my life. I was happy. I didn't miss anything. And then the cruise was over. And I'm at home one day. I'm thinking about building this new company, coaching how to build business environments. And I'm procrastinating. I'm sure some of you have done that. George, you've done that. And I'm sitting on the couch, and I had help. I think, you know, having, you know, a spousal help every now and then is great. I'm sitting on the couch one morning, and I'm uh, watching Kelly and Regis. And uh, <laughs> that's not the funny part. The funny part is when I said, uh, hey, hon, come over here a minute. And she came over. And I said, uh, you know, that Kelly Ripa is the finest-looking woman I have ever seen. <laughs> Gentlemen. Don't do that if you want to stay if you want to stay retired, because as her hand was on my shoulder, it started to squeeze like a piece of steel saying, I think it's time for you to get out of the house and go to work. And so there was some motivation that I bought on myself. Don't uh, to make the same mistake I made. But it wasn't all that it's cracked up to be. I was bored and I became semi depressed because I missed doing what I really enjoy doing which is an ingredient of building a successful business environment that I'm going to include by just talking about a couple of them. Keys to what I believe to be my success are the same keys in building a successful business environment. The appreciation and respect for people. Do we really have it as leaders? Do we really understand the disconnect that we've created over the last five, six, seven years of this cut and slash and put the money on the bottom line? What are people thinking about when we're managing the bottom line versus investing in the top line, investing in training and development versus cutting training and development. And does that really uh, show the respect? And does it really build an environment where people can realize their personal goals and dreams? I am a huge believer in training and development. The biggest issue in Crawford Company over the last five years was the de-emphasis of training and development, taking our company from being the world's best trainer of adjusters in the world who trained my adjusters in 1984. It's the only company I even thought of to a company that was not thought of at all, not only within our people but outside our organization. So we went from being the world's greatest trainer to not, and that impacted our company more than any single thing that's impacted our company. And we are fixing that, by the way. In case you're wondering, we will become, again, the world's greatest trainer of adjusters. Recognition and pay, is it there? Do we really want to take the risk of paying better than average? It's kind of scary when you got all the pressure to make that one or two cent call on a quarterly basis. 
it's a risk that I'm willing to take and invest in. Miss a performance review and what have you done? Think about building an environment and walking in and 700 performance reviews out of 4,000 are late. What does that tell you? What does it tell you? Does it tell you that I really know what your contributions are? Do I really care? And that's what I felt faced at uh, not only Prudential, but at, uh, at Crawford Company. Today, we're running about 98% on time, and I grade uh, officers on the percentage of being on time. It is the key date for an employee. So if you want an environment, recognize your people and recognize them on time and recognize what they do. It's extremely important. And then communication, I, I can't talk enough about it. I could go on. I'm end up in a minute. i got about a minute. Uh, it is so important. Something that we talk about a lot is communications, but do we really do it? Uh, I write a letter every quarter. I do a video when I can, and I send it to every employee in the world. We even translate it into the Chinese and Japanese. I, can, I would love to see one of my videos in Japanese, but, uh, but I have it. But we do send it out. And every employee at our company has a card with our objectives on it. The mailroom clerk has that card. I ask for it to show it every, you know, every meeting I have. I have a meeting every other Friday morning with calling in 10 employees from around the country to sit in the boardroom with me and just talk about what are they hearing about what I said you would touch soon. In other words, I was a, in a line of succession of CEOs. Why would they believe me? So I asked them to believe when you can touch, like pay, like uh, surveys, uh, like performance reviews. And so I've called in 10 every other Friday. I've done 190 now because that's, we do 10 at a time. So it's intimate, and they feel comfortable talking to me. And it tells me what my team is talking about once they leave the, quote, meeting in the corner office. And are they really communicating down throughout the organization? I'm going to have to skip a little bit of this, uh, but here's one, two more things I want to talk about. One is the, the intelligence of the employee and building a successful business environment. Who do you think has the most intelligence about changing operational issues in a company? Do you think it's the home office staff of 100 who hasn't touched the client, the, cust the customer, the policy, or the procedures in five and ten years like me? Or do you think it's the adjuster, the banker, uh, the loan closer, the lawyer th that are the billing out the 24 hours a day? Did you get that? The lawyer who's billing out 24 hours a day? Okay. Who do you think has more knowledge about it? And it's the people that are doing the job every day. I knew more about it when I was a clerk and underwriter and adjuster than the supervisors and managers. So I, every change I make in a company is made operationally through a group of people that come in from the field. I just introduced a whole new way of handling workers' comp in this country and 22 people from the field, nurses, adjusters, doctors, and supervisors built the program, not me. And is it more acceptable to the employees when they know their people they respect from the field help build it? Do you think it's easier to sell? It is. The intelligence of the people that we have working for you is immense. Tap into it. It's, it's extremely important. And the last thing I want to make sure that I cover is I manage with seven pieces of paper from billion-dollar companies to small units. These are the seven pieces of paper. I'll be glad after the meeting to share some of them with you, but it is a tool that I use to communicate to the analysts in New York, to the board of directors from an educational standpoint and knowledge standpoint, to the clerks and supervisors in the field. Same documents. It's used in China. It's used in New York. It's used in San Francisco. There is no change to these seven pieces of paper. And what does it do for me? And I guarantee you, if I ask you this question, you don't have to answer me, but how many meetings have you gone into in your company and you see manager after manager come in and make a presentation and they're all different formats? And then you're studying this graph, that bar chart, and this circle, pie chart, what have you. It doesn't happen at the companies that I'm trying to run. It is seven pieces of paper that are very fundamental, very simple, but it conveys the entire language of our company. I use it to plan. It is, it is the plan. I use it to build accountability. I use it to communicate, and I use it to educate. I want our people to understand what's going on in our company, and I can just show you one of these, and even George, sitting here in the front row, 
can tell me if this is case count trends in our company, would you say it's going well over the last four years or not? Not well. Very quick education about, and you can do this for everything, turnover ratio, everything. But it brings people together. It brings accountability. You cannot talk your way past these seven pieces of paper. And it removes something that's in a lot of companies, and that's fear of managing, fear of doing something, fear of walking into a room. Remove it. Remove it entirely. And I've walked into a room with fear, like you have at some point in your, your life, about not knowing what the expectation is. Take it away. And in its place, put accountability that's clear, concise, and they built. And you'll find your environment changing greatly. Last thing, balance of life. I never I talk about it every time you've heard me. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be where I am today with the most important thing being my family. And uh, I have given a, you know, I've worked hard. I've worked long hours. I've worked sometimes to 11 or 12 o'clock when I was a controller at Allstate. But I told my family where I was, what I was doing, and what time period this would last but also coached my kids from T-ball to traveling high school teams. And it was the best part of my life. And when we ask people, if we don't do it for ourselves and we don't allow our people to have it, I think you will lose out long term. Balance of life is extremely important to me. It should be uh, practiced and it should be allowed in your organization. So overall, you build a healthy environment for people, a really healthy, touchable environment for people and you're going to have a successful business operation. I believe it, and that's what I like talking about. So thank you very much for listening to me, and I'll be glad to entertain any question that you might have. It's hard to push all this into 20 minutes, George. Okay. I just want to tell them something. Okay. Okay. Uh, as always, we are taping this. It will be available tomorrow on our website. Uh, so please, if you have a question, would you use a microphone? We've got microphones around the room. talk about having a healthy environment. I wonder what metrics you use to, to see how well you're doing. How do, you, how do you measure how healthy the environment is? That's a great question. Uh, one, uh, I committed when I first took over both companies, the last couple, Prudential and uh, Crawford, uh, doing surveys, employee surveys. I do one every six months at Crawford and Company. Remember, the last two companies I've had, they've had five presidents in five and six years. One, you're never going to succeed doing that. Uh, and you also, it's harder to gain uh, the respect from the employees when they know that the, the senior leadership changes a lot. So I basically committed to four or five things right at the front and say, don't, don't back away from me. I don't expect you to rush to me either. But as we do what we say and touch it, then become ambassadors of our company, become believers. So the survey is a huge tool for me. We did one when I first got here, and we did one uh, six months ago, and we're getting ready to do another one. Uh, between the first one, I got a 58% response, which is lousy, in my opinion, uh, because people have two fears about surveys. One, they'll get me if I say what I think. And the second one is they won't do anything about it, so why take the time to do it? Those are the two things you have to overcome. Uh, and I say clearly that, one, if you work for a company that will get you, you're working for the wrong company. And, you know, you say, well, yeah, you can say that because you don't know what happened over the last four or five years. There's a building of trust, and it doesn't happen overnight. My expectations that, uh, when the second survey came out at 60-some percent response, I was a little disappointed, but the results were up 12 percent. And so we're building trust. The next one's going to show a quantum leap because they have touched now five, six, seven things in building our environment. That they, It's not my words. It's what they can touch. The salary at Crawford & Company, the midpoint of every job grade in our company as of June of this past year, is 3% better than average in the industry for the same job. So they can touch that now. So uh, you have to measure. The metrics for that are extremely important. And I plan to do it for six months, every six months, for probably another, probably another year or so. And then we'll go to an annual review. And it's done worldwide. Yes? I appreciate it. I appreciate your comments about how real operational change can come from the people that touch the customer, not the people that are sitting in, in the back room. But in this day and age, with so much outsourcing being done, I actually spent a little bit of time at a Delta ticket counter with a lot of people waiting who got frustrated talking on the phone to somebody in India. Do you, Whether it's with your company directly or, or industry as a whole, would you comment on how 
how you can continue to make change within your organization when so much of the customer contact is being outsourced overseas? Well, I think it makes it difficult, and I also think outsourcing is becoming highly questionable today as far as its benefits. Uh, I just read an article in Wall Street the other day about is it really as beneficial as we think it is, and I'm not sure I can even answer that question. We don't do a lot of outsourcing at Crawford Company. We do some uh, in one of the companies we have in New York, but not a lot. I think you have to find out when you're outsourcing to a great deal, go directly to your clients and, and poll them and, and survey your clients of what they see and what they touch. I mean, our clients are major companies. They're the, they're the UPSs and the FedExs and the uh, Coca-Colas of the world. They're large corporations, and we have risk managers in all of those companies. They're risk managers, so we bring them together or we survey them to find out how we're doing, and they're quick to tell you. But uh, that's about as far as I could go as far as answering that question. I think it can become a growing concern if you're not uh, building metrics to measure the effectiveness of your outsourcing operations. But I don't have to do that right now, so I'm in pretty good shape. And I didn't do it a lot at Prudential either. We had very little outsourcing overseas. We did start something in Ireland, uh, but I wasn't there to see it through as far as uh, how effective it was. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, how you doing? Good. I had the honor and p privilege of actually working under your leadership when you were VP of retail distribution at Prudential. President. 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 Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I earned it, so I'm going to. Okay. Um, as you know, we definitely had recruiting issues or problems with recruiting quality financial services and insurance agents. Then, do you see any differences in recruiting uh, financial services and insurance agents today? in the 21st century versus the 20th century? Well, I think there's a huge difference. You heard one of them here at Terry School of Business where they are starting to recognize the importance of it and, and starting programs for CFPs. Uh, they're not starting a program to train life insurance agents. Life insurance agents days, captive life insurance agents are pretty much over. And I mean, I know that may startle some of you, but uh, uh, you walk into a, an organization or a group and say, look, I'm Tom Crawford. I'm a life insurance agent. Can I talk to you? are in a party and everyone goes this way, you walk into that same party and say, I'm a certified financial planner, and what happens? They want to talk to you. I mean, I've talked to several people in this room today that are, you know, 35, you know, 20, 30 years old. Well, if I'd had a financial plan when I was 30 years old, I would be in a different financial position than I am today. And my son has one. He's 35. He has a financial plan. It is a great job. And I think that has changed dramatically. I was invited to Louisville, the University of Louisville, to talk about sponsoring from Prudential when I was there, a whole school dedicated to uh, uh, financial services. It is financial services today. Whether I like it or not, I grew up in the insurance business. But in reality today, the biggest change is it's not the insurance industry any longer. It is the financial services world, and it gives us all m much greater opportunities if you're in the financial services world. There's a new bank starting up over here. I've talked to some of their people. Uh, there's people, banks, doing property and casualty. So it opens up a, a, a wide field, and I think I'm delighted to hear that the Terry College has recognized that and starting a program for it. It's a great job. It, and it's easier to recruit, too, by the way, much easier. So you've talked about the relative importance of satisfying employees and uh, clients. Um, when you look at some of the problems that corporations have had um, with fraud and so on, it seems that stockholders have played a huge part in their thinking, and I wonder how you see the importance of stockholders. Well, certainly they're important. I am a stockholder, and I'm sure most of you in this room are stockholders. I believe that you're getting better and clearer information in your reports, your annual reports, than you've ever had before. Clearly, uh, we're talking about uh, the rewards for officers in a way that's never been done before. Uh, when I know I just filled out a form that was a quarter of an inch thick about everything that happens to me, how am I rewarded, uh, how, what are my benefits, what is my, is it, am I in a country club, who pays for it, cars. I think the clarity, which you should have as a stockholder, is there today, or you will see it in your next round of reports. And I think that's a healthy thing. I think there is a, there is a mistrust that's grown up over years that we've allowed to happen as leaders of companies. And uh, being a leader of a company, I never even thought about dis disclosing to the de detail that I'm asked to disclose today or sign off things I'm asked to sign off on right now. 
And uh, along with those things, for your information as stockholders, there's a, another piece of paper that calls this is how many years you get in prison for these things. It's uh, sentencing guidelines that are published and, and circulated to all of us. So I think the, the, the winner in this whole thing will be the stockholders, clearly. And I think it's a good thing. And I regret greatly what we've had to go through as a business to offset the lack of integrity of leaders in certain companies because that's where Sarbanes-Oxley comes from. It's to force us to do the things. And I will tell you this, the control and accountability in the company should have been there all along. But Sarbanes-Oxley probably would not have stopped the things that occurred at Enron and some of the other companies. I mean, if you're dishonest and you want to cheat, you probably can still cheat. And that's the sad part of having to deal with Sarbanes-Oxley and the cost it puts on us because of people who did not have the uh, integrity to be in the jobs they held are this almost greed that has consumed so many people today. Um, you know, I, I, I've not had it. I'm, I, I'm proud of that. I, I, I maintain why this book caught my eye is what we're faced with every day. Those phone calls that say, if you know, I want this, and if you don't give it to me, I'm going to do this to you. Do it to me because we're not going to give, you to, give it to you if it lacks integrity. Yes, sir. I really uh, ditto and, and support your uh, philosophy of respect and uh, for not only the employee, but uh, I'm sure the customer as well. If you were uh, chairman of uh, General Motors today, you just got elected, and uh, you have an employee base that uh, uh, great workers, uh, tell me the first thing you would do to uh, turn that company around. I think I'd call a union into my office, the leadership of the union, and I'd sit down and, and talk about the things that they think that we could do to save our company. Uh, I, I have had to deal with four, three, four major unions in my career. And um, they're there because of things that weren't there by management. Management didn't put the right things in place. So they didn't do the right thing. They didn't build a great environment for people. It's therefore you have a union. But once you have them and you're not going to get rid of them, certainly in the auto industry, I think you would set them down first and talk to them about how do you save the company. And I think back to a long, long time ago, and I love the Studebaker automobile, and they said, you know, we're going out of business if you don't do these things. And they didn't do them, and they went out of business. So who wins? Uh, I think you tell the union that uh, we need a win here. And I think you sit down on chalkboard, you bring some of your leadership in with the union, and you work out what do we need to do, and are we lose our company. And I, I don't know of any other thing that I would put ahead of that, is to win over the leadership of the union. I don't think those employees want to see that company go out of business. Um, but I also believe that there's things that has to happen like quality. And uh, I, I regret that you know, the foreign automakers uh, recognized that long before we did. They've recognized the hybrid automobile long before we have. Why? I think if they talked to consumers and their employees, they would have found out that they should have been doing these things five and ten years ago. It's not too late. I think these companies can still pull themselves out. But that's the best answer I can give you. Yes. Tom, this is a question about the, the insurance industry. When you're usually given maybe one or two days before a catastrophic uh, disaster happens like Katrina, how on earth do you gear up and, and plan and train the adjusters that are needed in the field in order to uh, represent your company? Well, there's a couple of ways. We have a catastrophe unit that's solely dedicated to, to responding to catastrophes around of the world. Actually, we have worldwide catastrophe coverage. Uh, that unit uh, has a list of thousands of adjusters, independent adjusters. There's more mom and pop adjusters in this country than there is Crawford companies. We only have about 5% of the marketplace. The rest of the business, profit and casualty, is controlled by mom and pop organizations, who, by the way, are something is happening to them that I regret. And I don't want to get off the subject, but you should know it as business people because it's an offshoot of Sarbanes-Oxley and the requirements we're putting people under. How are the mom and pops going to survive Sarbanes-Oxley and certifications that we're being asked to do that cost us millions of dollars to do? How are the mom and pops going to survive? And without the mom and pops, your service in our world will suffer because I think the small companies and the mom and pops keeps you honest and keeps you driving forward all the time. And I think they're in great pressure right now because of Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, getting back to catastrophe, uh, we have a unit that builds just that. We contact them. We have a certain group that we pay their benefits for, and they are on standby at all times to respond to a catastrophe. 
but there is no way to respond in, in full force to a Katrina and a Rita uh, that hits our country. I, there's probably 20,000 adjusters down there. We had 400, and the industry was short. There's still claims open out of those storms. You can't build up and keep people on standby just waiting for a storm to hit. Uh, so we have that unit that calls and tries to put as many people together as possible. And our core group is about 100 that are already, already, always ready to go. And normally that suffices. But in an event like that, there's just not enough people. But we do have a unit that addresses it. One more? One more? No more. Well, good. I uh, appreciate it, George. Thanks very much. Tom, thank you. I, I think his employee first message uh, was worth the, the price of admission. We thank you for sharing your, your time, your life, your experiences with us, Tom. We've got something we want to give you if you come back up oh, for a second. Sure. Bucket of paint. Bucket of paint. It's exactly what it is. I probably shouldn't even explain. Most people know what this is. Uh, this is only goes to speakers of this event. This is a, a special uh, 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 Terry Third Thursday golf shirt just for you. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank Appreciate you. it One very more much. Thing. Well, I'm going to do this more often. This is this is a, a, a piece of, uh, of glass I think you will uh, like very much. All Thank right. you for being with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. All right. Don't forget Walter Driver next time, March 16th. Also, uh, if you're parked in the parking deck behind us here, you just have to tell them Terry Third Thursday and I'll let you ride out without paying. Or you can get your uh, ticket validated here at the front. Thank you for being with us. We are adjourned. <laughs>